Good, so we're gonna do two rounds of three questions. We're gonna do that two times. So first round, just make sure you, make sure you have your question. Right? Question, all right, so we got, and then you, all right, three, all right. So let's go, could you please direct your question to, uh, I remember the, Village, community, and a nation for building for raising a child. Our chancellor, Dr. Stewart, and uh, Dr. Dr. Ken, right? Uh, my question will be directed to um, Dr. Ken. Um, thanks for that presentation. Uh, the question is. How do you raise, how do you use the community to raise a child with the crunch behavior of villages, communities? For example, in this, I'm recalling from memory in the papers, a report on the death of a child in Sisters Village, West Coast Police. The child was abused, sexually abused. Reports were made to the police. Money was passed. The child was murdered and drowned. The whole village survived. Do not do nothing. That was a black village. Second example on the quarantine. The village we are in, a brown village, mentally retarded, retarded, <laughs> scrunched around, the Kabbalah didn't pay any attention to her. She was sexually abused by villagers. Um, someone from outside came into the village, noticed it. And when the guardian reported it to the police, nothing happened. Money was passed. I heard that um, the guardian took the child from where she lived in her home to where she lived. Within a month, that girl died. Nothing happened. The clannish behavior of these villagers, brown or black, how could you raise a child within that, those contexts? Thank you. I know the context and situation is always important, but try to keep them very short. <coughs> I say unto all of you, Al Shalanti. My names are Dr. Richard Yates. Presidential Ambassador of the organization called G-R-A-S-P-M-A-T-Y-X, Grass Max. I would like to learn this evening, based on what my momo, mother, mother said to me, anytime a leader, a politician, a preacher, or a teacher speaks, always listen to what they are not saying. Listen to what they are not saying. I need to learn from the panel or anyone in the audience as of the year 1985 when the Honorable LFS Burnham died. Did any one of us did a study to find out whether or not juvenile delinquency went down or went up in this country. It's not a for anyone on the panel who perhaps have information about or even for the Minister, Mr. Kamraj, to tell us whether or not, based on Guyana, from the time the Honorable LFS Burnham died in 1985, that the act upon two children as being treated as juvenile delinquent was went down or went up, or was it also a political assault by children? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, panelists. Um, my question is 
So the young lady seated next to the student, I can't remember your name. Um, how do you plan to protect those young persons located far in the maybe interior regions around around now, Moru now and Shelton, who are um, there at their homes and after their parents, grandparents come home from their their farms and they plan to have this exciting touch of alcohol. They're there in the homes and experience um, abuse from maybe every member, male and female. How do you plan to protect um, those persons far away from um, the coast? Thank you. Good evening again, and thank you for the question. I think that is the challenge. How exactly is this village going to raise a child when the village has problems? First, I want to say the concept of the village has changed. The village, we used to think of a, a geographical location. We can highlight which streets, which communities, which families. But the concept of a village now has grown, and technology has helped that. So I don't want us to think of, of a village as just geography and specific people. I want us to think of a village as what resources, what opportunities for support, what networking do we have, which mentors are there in the community. And we also need to separate the good and the, from the bad and the ugly. So what ugly aspects of the neighborhood do we need to shield our children from? What, uh, what bad aspects do we need to shield them from? Now, how are we going to get these villages? So, so the people who are here at the Pegasus, who are here in these messages, we want to hope that there'll be a ripple effect. But it could be that we have to do more than that, that we have to move out of the Pegasus and go into these communities that you've spoken about and figure out how we reach them to have these public education talks. So we educate families about abuse and dispel some of the stigma and shame. We help them identify, just as the research has shown us, that 82% of children are being abused by people known to them, then what we are saying is that the village is full of perpetrators. That this idea of the stranger danger is no longer the biggest risk to our children. So we now have to break apart this concept of the village. And the village I was talking about are the positive aspects we need to draw from. So be it family, so your blood biological family, but it also be the people you work with who is a positive um, impact in the community. It could be a church leader, it could be a police officer. Where are the safe spaces? Do we have green spaces in our communities where children can go and it's lit? So they can go and play some cricket and play some football. Or is it just the street corners where the gangs can now have the opportunity to recruit them and, and show them some support and positivity for the first time in their lives? Remember I said what we repeatedly say to children becomes their inner voice? So the first time a child hears something positive, it can't come from a perpetrator. It has to come from us. We have to tell them, we believe in you. I will listen to you. I will help you. I will protect you. So those voices have to come from us. I, I hope that, that, that helps a bit. The, uh, the other um, gentleman's question, I think he was asking about the studies. What studies have been done? What is the research showing us? But um, as an academic and a, re and a researcher, I want to point out one of the, the challenges we have, and this is not just GAM, this is across the board. One of the challenges with research is that, as I mentioned, we need information and we need data. If we don't have it, we don't know the nature and the shape and the size of the problem. Given the changes to the, to the, to the bill, we no longer are going to include these children who are true and who are wandering, who are running away. Some of the research that has been done showed that the majority of children in Guyana who are presenting before the juvenile justice system were ones who run away from home. So right away, we know that from now on, when we collect data under the remit of this new bill, we're going to see different figures. So you are right. So figures now, we might say, my goodness, the numbers have gone down. But that doesn't mean the number of the, it's a type of, of offending. So we have to, to really place a lot of importance on our monitoring and surveillance systems, our data capture system, for everybody who works in an agency and has to complete a form. I really urge you to not leave out bits in the form, not take the shortcuts. 
we have to, for those of you who are responsible for people who are filling out those forms, so let's say the commission is here, and other people who are in charge of the agencies, we have to have that monitoring and surveillance so we can have that data, so we can use that data now to inform the interventions and make sure we are targeting the right problems. Ms. Wall. Thank you, sir, for directing your question to me. In my conclusion, I stated that we go back a bit. The CIC, we worked with a multi multidisciplinary team, that is DPP, the police, and child protection agency. Currently, there's only um, um, CACs that are operating in region three, four, five, and six. So in my conclusion, I stated clearly that we need to have more child advocacy centers in every region in Guyana. Yes. For now, it is, a bit, it is a bit difficult for us to reach the children in the hinterland areas, and we know for sure that there are lots of cases that are unreported to us in those areas. So we still have to work with the police force, we still have to work with DPP, we still have to work with you as citizens. Only you can help us to get to those places currently. So like I said, we need CACs in all of those administrative regions. And we're trying our best to get that up and running. But, like her minister said, it takes a lot of resources for us to get there. So hopefully, with prayer and support from all of you here today, we can get CACs in all of our regions today uh, within the next few years to help the nation's children. I sure hope that explains or answer your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swall. Uh, we go to the next round of questions. We have one, two, whoa, whoa. Good evening, everyone. My question is actually for the Minister of Public Security or for the Chancellor, but I don't see the Minister in the panel. Um, I have my question to anyone in the panel that can answer it. I noticed that the Juvenile Justice Act has not been given a commencement date. So until then, the Juvenile Defenders Act 1931 is still a matter of law. And we observe that we're moving away from offenses like truancy and wandering. So I would just like to know how does the executive of the judicial sectors of government plan to handle the instances of truancy and wandering until the juvenile justice commencement, the juvenile justice act commences, and also for the plethora of juveniles that are currently being held in custody for offenses of truancy and wandering, will there be some sort of review to the sentence since we've progressed away from those offenses in the year 2018? Thank you. Thank you. The law of law is absurd. My question is for our Chancellor. My question is whether or not your plans to, in the future, to remove the juvenile courts from the magistrate's court when it's opening. I know it's a question for resources, but there may be certain stigma that will be attached to the magistrate's building. Even young people. While the environment, the court, um, there's efforts to make the environment more child friendly, but going to the court of itself may also create some level of discomfort for a child. Whether or not there's plans to remove the court from the George from my street court to some other building, that person cannot see a child going there. Because you all even know what they could be for. Thank you. Another question really, uh, we do have this for all of once in a while. And occasionally we will have something on the television. But I was just wondering whether we don't have a more systematic and in depth approach. We have teachers who say encounter. Do we have a course that educates them to recognize cases of child abuse? Yeah. We have the University of Guyana, we have, we have centers where the we're going to go, maybe part of the education, and the education has to do with the OCD also. I was going to go to the I don't know, but in this case, it's just too academic. Right. Maybe we can have those things in school. Yes. Now, the television stations, in, I mean, you have all sort of things, and why are you expecting us to be some concern about this serious matter? I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Thank you. 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 Th
and there was several years in the Shinra Rokia time, public time, and so facilitate the type of education. And if you come here on a night, most schools have PTAs, so you have a four-year period of training. So if you try to have activities where you can send people to the PTAs and, you know, have discussion and educate the parents, it has to be something all encompassing. Uh, that's my uh, suggestion. Thank you. Hello, good night everyone. Okay. Um, so for International Youth Day, the theme was Safe Spaces for Youth. And a lot of you on the panel alluded to the topic for this year's International Youth Day. With that being said, what do you consider a safe space for youth? What are the characteristics? Who is responsible for creating these? What's next? Who should take the lead on this? And I'll direct that question to Marvel. Um, Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, all protocols observed before COVID rights in the Child Commission, Women and Gender Equality Commission. On the 1st of June 2018, the Rights of the Child Commission visited the juvenile uh, holding facility. And there were still children in there being charged for wandering. Um, and then I was a bit perplexed and miffed because I wanted to know why children were still in there being tried for wondering after the bill had been assented to the Juvenile Justice Bill. And I learned on the 30th of June 2018 at the Rights of the Child Commission prayer breakfast through the learned attorney, uh, Emily Dodson, that the Minister of Public Security, the Honorable Minister, came around the time is still to pass a commencement order. And so my question are to the Minister, the Honourable Minister, why has this happened and when do you intend it to happen? Because if this bill has been in the making since 2004, don't you think it is time that we really walk the talk? I thank you. Uh, to our learned psychologist, Dr. Khan and Dr. Stewart, I want to share some stats. 481 cases of abuse reported by the Child Care Protection Agency for the first six months of 2018. 393 girls, 18 boys, and they share the staggering statistics of 238 reported cases of child sexual abuse. Now, the question is are we witnessing an amalgamation of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences that has occasioned? The wanton use of drugs such as ecstasy within our schools, which is happening in the schools, I'm sure it's happening in the world. And uh, just a follow up, will placing guidance counselors in school make a difference? I thank you. Clinical social worker, Nicole Cole, also. Thank you very much. The first question was to the Chancellor. Thank you very much. Um, that's an important question as to why the commencement order has not yet been passed. After it was assented to in June this year, after the debate in Parliament in April this year, we decided that before we bring the Act into operation, that there must be a costing done as to what will be uh, what will it cost to make it operational? We have to have, like every other act, certain facilities. We have to make the appointment of director of what's called a JG, director of juvenile justice. We have to set up the um, juvenile justice committee because the act has a brand new regime and an organizational structure. We also have to ensure that there is some training for the magistrates, as the Chancellor just mentioned. And that, indeed, we indicated will take about three to four months. That's around the time now. And the commencement draft, I did it myself, it has gone for purposes of being in the form of a, the commencement order at the Attorney General's chambers. And I hope there will be any mix up there. Um, so. <laughs> So uh, that is definitely on par because these are the things that have to be done. And as I said, UNICEF was kind enough to do the costing. We were thinking of at least four 
uh, facilities for where children will go. Um, somebody mentioned about the interior. We have to have one in the interior. But because it is over 590 to 600 million Ghana dollars, by the way, some people felt it was US dollars. No, it is Ghana dollars. That's about 2.5 million US dollars. We have to do it in a phased program. But in view of the fact that magistrates have now been changed, the magistrates' court has been redesigned by our Chief Justice and all of that, you certainly going to get a commencement order within a couple of days being in the official visit. Amen. Thank you. But, and by the way, sorry about that. I have given an instruction that nobody will be charged for wandering and all of that. I don't know what happened there. There were still children in the That is. That is. That is. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to get that rectified, but in any event, the order will be passed. I don't know who to hand the mic over to here. Good. Thank you, Minister. To answer the question from Mr. Will first, in relation to whether we plan to move the court from its present location, in the grand scheme of things, long term, we do intend to have a modern court complex. Uh, so juvenile court and all the other specialized courts will be housed there. However, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, so we start where we are. And it's right, two portals have already been converted, what previously used to be a traffic court, and they've now been converted, one for a courtroom, and the other larger uh, space for a child-friendly room and play room for a probation and director child care and probation office, uh, office and also for a uh, conference room. Now, in relation to the transitional uh, provisions, the act makes provision for that to answer the question for uh, this gentleman in the third row. And I can direct you to section 128 of the act. So when this, when the commencement order comes into being, uh, we have the Juvenile Offenders Act as well as the Training School Act being repealed. When those acts are repealed, the sections of the transitional provision will come into being, and section 124 specifically states that where before the coming into effect of, or coming into force of the act, there were proceedings of which you mentioned that would have commenced in relation to juveniles under those um, acts. Uh, those proceedings shall be dismissed and the juvenile or child shall be referred to the director of child care protection agency who shall consult with the director of public prosecutions for any further action. Now, in relation to the uh, stats, because I have here today, knowing that uh, questions may be asked about statistics, I cannot answer what predated uh, coming to 1985, but I can answer the present. Uh, for this year, I can give you according to the uh, magistrate districts, the amount of cases that we may have had uh, and the numbers in relation to our young persons. And of course, this will include status offenses that are now uh, taken off the statute books, wandering and those type of offenses. For the Georgetown Magistrate District, a uh, number of cases from January to May, prior to the act coming to end, we have had 30 cases. For the quarantine Magistrate District, for that same period, 20 cases. For the East Burmese Magistrate District, 29 cases. For the West Burbis Magisterial District, four cases. For the West Demerara Magisterial District, 16 cases. East Demerara Magisterial District, six uh, cases. Essipibo, Coast and Islands, uh, 18 cases. Upper Demerara Magisterial District, that's the point of Linden, nine cases. And the Rupununi Magisterial District, 11 cases. And these figures, of course, would reflect uh, offenses which really are now uh, decriminalized. I asked about cases, adverse childhood experiences. I shared some stats. 
on child abuse reporting for 2018, and I asked the two doctors, the two psychologists, to answer. Thank you for that question, young lady. I was at the Jessica conference um, a while back. Mr. Hoppy invited me, and I spoke about this. Now you asked, what is a safe space? For me personally, there are a lot of big words the UN everybody uses. But simply put, a safe space, especially for young people, is anywhere, whether it's physical or digital, where they are free to express themselves, where their ideas are listened to, where their strengths are strengthened, and where they're, where they're encouraged to speak out and where persons will listen. You asked about the characteristics. As an advocate for cultural diversity and heritage, again, it's a multicultural society, the world is multicultural. So I can't give you characteristics for a safe space. It depends on the culture yeah. and it depends on the needs of people, especially young people. Yeah. And as an, especially as an app, but I'm going ahead of myself. <laughs> but, um, and I spoke about this at UNESCO. And we need to take into consideration the various cultures within our society and how we are creating these spaces where persons can express themselves. Yes. Um, who creates them? Anyone can create them. Of course, we say the government, the practitioners, community members, anybody can create a safe space. But my number one value is anybody with compassion. Because you need compassion in safe spaces. For us to achieve all these things that we talked about that are supposed to be happening in safe spaces. And I created a safe space for bereaved children. I created a safe space within my, my, um, my African village of the Namsel, where we can explore our, our cultural heritage. So wherever you are, whoever you are, once you have compassion, you're responsible for creating that, that safe space and knowing what are the requirements or the, uh, the needs of, of the young people that you want to serve. Thank you. Just to address the, the last two questions, one asked about courses for training and the other spoke to some statistics. Um, so I'm glad to hear we have the statistics. I'm glad you broke it down for us and pointed out that approximately 20% of the victims are, are, are males. It's one of the things we don't always acknowledge and it's a, it's a cultural issue that when we have male child victims and female perpetrators, it's regarded as a rite of passage rather than naming it for what it is, which is abuse, right. child sexual abuse. So I think um, uh, it, it highlights the problem. We know we have a very serious problem. And hopefully when we have all these parts of the equation coming together, so we now have a, a bill and ironically, um, Minister, I noticed that it took 14 years for the bill to be passed around the age I become a juvenile and cannot assume responsibility. So, so I'm glad. So sometimes the journey is long, but we're seeing things coming to fruition. So now we have an idea of the shape and size of the problem. We're putting the tools in place where we can address the problem. With respect to the research, I'm uh, sorry, to the training. So the University of Guyana already has a well-established BSc in social work, where we're training social, where they're training social workers, and and some of the competencies are in there. I'm also, um, as you know, the UG is also developing programs in psychology. They currently have a diploma in psychology, which Marva is, is, is in the first cohort. Uh, we are also working on a master's in clinical psychology, and there will also be a bachelor's uh, in general psychology. So these courses, they're going to build capacity in Guyana. We're going to be training psychologists. So look out for this. In two to five years, the landscape for psychologists is going to flourish and we will help fill an issue with the professionals you need to address the problems. Finally, with respect to you asked about the role of guidance counselors in schools. Now, as we start to build capacity, we will be able to distinguish roles and competencies. Guidance counselors have a specific remit uh, and, and a specific skill set. Right now, when we have limited resources, people may have to act outside of their remit to fill a need. But as we build capacities in other specialist areas, like clinical psychologists, eventually school psychologists, etc., those are the professionals we need. And I also want to make a, a, an appeal on behalf of the professions that uh, to the governments, to the budget holders, to the influencers in the room, that we need the resources to train and to build capacity in Guyana. 
that we need to have professionals, more psychologists, more social workers at the master's level and above, and that can only be done with the hard tangible resources. So if we are truly serious about juvenile justice and the future of our youth, we have to back that up with some hard resources uh, and commitment. Ms. Moore, you asked about um, the sexual abuse and trauma it affect the, the way children will probably turn to drugs. And yes, um, we know that that could lead to self-destructive behavior, which includes uh, the use of drugs and the use of alcohol and the use of the treatment, etc. We know that the studies show that yes, it does the type of trauma that could lead to those possibilities. And as um, Dr. Khan said, once we have the, the persons in place to be able to, um, the Social Protection Office really does a pretty decent, good job at addressing some of those problems. Do we have work to do? Yes, we do have work to do. You also uh, asked about the safe spaces. And like Martha said, we all can create safe spaces for persons. As long as we are committed, we are trustworthy, we can um, create safe spaces. The, uh, you know, just one night I got a call from a young lady that was 14 years old that was ran away from home and had no place to go. In the middle of the night, and getting out of my house to find somewhere for these children to stay. So there was a safe place. I created that safe place, like Marvel, to have persons stay to my NGO and to be able to help. So we all can work together to ensure until we get all the resources we need to be able to protect the children of Guyana. Thank you very much. Uh, we had a lot of information this evening. Uh, it's a lot to process. I hope you're not saturated. Um, but let me invite Ms. Bopal. Member of Team Pace. Good evening all. On behalf of the University and DVC, Kudok Mohammed, Dr. Kudok Mohammed, I would like to invite my colleagues to give a start of appreciation to the panelists. Excellency, Jeremy Schwentik. Yeah. These 
and other other persons who partnered with this university, that be, those being the staff of the Pegasus Hotel, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Peace, Professor Purun Mohammedan Staff, Ms. Afika Esbran, Ms. Ravana Aziz, Ms. Christine Chavadir, Ms. Tara Smith, Ms. Marlene Bhopal, and intern Shaneli Wilson. The personal officer, Mr. Jeffrey Walcott, the local media board, and Mr. Neil Sukraj, staff and staff of the Inversions Team. We are also grateful for the work of those members of the university who serve as ushers, and to the civil society participants who grace us with your presence and ideas in the floor and online. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for coming. All of you did a part of this occasion, we want to invite you to the next. Ten and turn eight talk, Saturday 15th. November 22nd, be here, all right? We know this was an interesting topic, and we got something better for you next time. Uh, at the end, there's a slight, there's a small reception outside, we have a chance to mingle and uh, interact with the members of the panel. So thank you for coming, enjoy the rest of the